this afternoon um, to, I think it's our third um, public lecture of the spring 2015 semester. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you and to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Charlie Monroe. Uh, Charlie is an assistant professor of um, <coughs> actually material science, material science and engineering at the um, University of Alabama, Birmingham, where uh, he's been for the last three years. He got his PhD in 2008 from Iowa um, and went from there immediately to working for Caterpillar. So he has three years of industry experience. And when I guess they wanted to send him to India, he decided he would rather go teach. Um, but he still collaborates with Caterpillar and other companies. And he's involved with the, let's see, the uh, found, you can just call it FEF if you the like. Foundry Education Foundation um, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, which apparently has huge capacities to melt things and pour them and, and stuff like that. Um, and we're very fortunate to have him here, and we're also fortunate because there's a collaboration that's between Montana Tech and University of Alabama, Birmingham in the rare earth area right now, and there's a potential to expand that in the, in the years ahead to include also other topics. So please join me in welcoming Charlie to give his talk on, actually before I do that, opportunities in materials processing and metal casting, but I want to bring to your attention next week's talk, which be, will be Dr. Alan Sessoms. It will be a physics and science policy talk related to reductions of the US nuclear weapons arsenal. Um, he's from Georgetown University back east, and that talk will be in the uh, chemistry biology building. So, Away. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, when I uh, was in my graduate degree program, uh, we had these kind of talks all the times, and it was always a difficult balance to go between, you know, the really nitty gritty, detailed stuff and the broader aspects of it. So I hopefully, hopefully, I've hit the right balance here. Um, but you know, you guys will have plenty of questions for me if I don't. Uh, I'm sure. So anyway, I've t entitled the talk for this afternoon "Opportunities in Metal Materials Processing, Specifically Metal Casting," because I'm going to show you some of what we do at the school and our in our lab as well as getting into some of the details of the rare earth magnesium project that we've been doing. So just an outline to orient your thoughts on this talk. Um, I'm going to go over some of the motivation that I have and why I'm in metal casting and why I like metal casting um, for the research area. Um, some people have advised me, why would you go into metal casting this time? Isn't we going to get rid of all metal casting and make everything out of a composite? Um, you know, we, I get a lot of those kind of discussions and I think there's a strong opportunity still for research in metal casting um, if you look worldwide and, and those opportunities. So I'll talk a little bit about the national perspective, at least from my vantage point. I'm going to go over a little bit of details in the MPAD uh, facilities that we have. That was work that we've done in collaboration with ARL over the last 10, 13 years, well before my time. <coughs> And specifically, there's two areas of focus. One would be in advanced composites, and the other would be my area in metal casting. And then finally, I'm going to dive into some more specific applications in magnesium rare earth. Um, I'm going to tell you what I like to think of as a magnesium story, uh, and, and hopefully then highlight some of the future work um, that we'd like to do in the area. OK. so. The economic story, my dad is the trade um, association president for the Steel Founders Society, and they work with all steel foundries in the North America, and um, uh, basically they have membership, and they look at steel foundry work over the last you know, 30 years or so. He's, he's been involved in that. And one of the stories he likes to tell is, you know, used to be that castings and infrastructure was actually an investment opportunity. So back in the 60s and 70s, inflation was getting high, and even doctors uh, would buy rail cars to hedge their investment and keep the, the value of their money because there was so much inflation um, that, you know, if you bought it today, it would hold its value if you bought rail cars. And, and so you, you held on to those as your investment until about the 80s or so. Um, so, you know, the question about manufacturing, and there was a lot of in investment in infrastructure at that time, um, things changed over the 80s um, uh, as, as we you know, had the downturns in an economy. And I, I know when my dad was hired in the 80s um, up in Chicago to do this kind of work, he was kind of the youngest of his generation. Um, and then you had a, another influx of people that, um, uh, you know, as, as 
budgets got tight and everything else, we had a change in the economic uh, booms and busts. So anyway, the, the ba ba basic line of the story is you've got your economic booms and busts that would go on, but if you just look, and this is a rather recent article, came out uh, January of this year on the 7th, um, essentially, if you look at the manufacturing share of the GDP since the 60s up through today, uh, it's maintained a pretty constant share of the GDP. Manufacturing hasn't really gone away, it stayed there. But it's pretty quiet. You know, it's not the common dialogue in the U.S. that manufacturing is maintained. And mostly we're seeing the same effect that you saw in agriculture, which is the manufacturing employment share has been going down, but we've maintained the share of the economy as, as we move on. So the output is maintained or gone up because we've gotten more efficient, but employment has, uh, um, has reduced. So we've got less people, but higher expectations from those people. So those trends have an effect on your education, they have an effect on your automation, and you, they have an effect on just the general population awareness uh, in terms of the economy. So the national incentives that you've got right now, Obama came out with the Materials Genome Project and his initiatives to revitalize manufacturing. We've got three institutes that were just created. One is the America's Makes uh, Institute that's out of Pennsylvania. They do focus on additive manufacturing there. Um, you've got the uh, DMDII that was just awarded last year, which is the Digital Manufacturing Innovation Institute. And you've got the Advanced Lightweight Metals Innovation Institute that just came out. All of them have a fairly strong metals focus uh, if you look at them, but that's not the national topic. In fact, we, if I go to Washington and say, hey, we'd like to do research in metal casting, they're going to go, well, that's not advanced manufacturing. So, so there's a real need to look at awareness in these areas and how do we promote uh, more investment in the research area that's there. So the uh, opportunity that exists, if you look at this from an educational standpoint, the, the motivation, the drive for the materials genome initiative is essentially how do we find, use new materials in a shorter period of time. So essentially they want to take the development of a new alloy from 25 years and do it in five, right? So you, they want rapid advancement of how do we explore, how do we find new materials. That's basically the task of the materials genome. So we've got some initiatives in that area. We also have some initiatives, if you look at composite processing throughout the country, what is the real limitation? We have an advanced composites lab there. We're doing some great stuff in, in uh, composites. Adoption is the big problem there. So it, yeah, you can make the composite, but how do I get higher volume composites? How do I put them on every vehicle if I make the composite? So there you have the other challenge that you've got an advanced process. How do I um, go through and learn and how do I do research to uh, actually process and create new materials? And then, of course, the question of sensors and other things, how do you inspect, which, which also is involved in that. Um, automation, the opportunities in automation, we see at the U.S. Steel Plant, Fairfield, just down the street from us, um, they used to employ in the thousands of employees, now they're in the hundreds of employees. There's had a factor of about 10 in reduction of employees that are there. So automation has gone a long way to reduce that number, but there's still going to be a high need for highly qualified, highly um, educated uh, people that continue to, to run those facilities. So automation has a strong tie-in if you look at the robotics area, other, where, um, other places that we have opportunities there. And then just an awareness. We've seen an outcropping of these television shows and other things that, that how are things made, how are they processed. There's some awareness that's being brought up there, but how do we get back into uh, the, the community dialogue that says we're manufacturing, uh, manufacturing has some emphasis. So at least the UAB response and uh, the UAB uh, uh, promotion of what we're, we're doing, and this is the sales pitchy kind of side of things, is our IMPAD Center. So essentially we've got this IMPAD Center, which is an acronym for the Materials Processing and Applications Development Center, um, which has two components. We've got a space of about 7,000 square feet of advanced composite manufacturing, and we have about 9,000 square feet of uh, advanced metals or, or metal casting that's on here. Um, I'm going to first show you briefly what we've done in the composites area, and then I'm going to move over and talk about the area I feel more comfortable with. Um, probably if you ask me any hard questions on the composite side, I'm going to hook you up with one of the professors in that area. So anyway, just FYI on that. 
Advanced composite manufacturing, essentially what we've done in that area is look at bio and natural fibers, recycling um, of those. We've done some uh, banana fibers and some other uh, types of uh, natural fibers to do in there. We've also looked at recycled carbon fiber um, uh, materials as well. These are some examples of components that we've, we've played around with, both uh, uh, helmet activities, implants, uh, structural components. We've done both seats, uh, frames. Uh, we've got a bus door panel that, that we're, was working on, we were working on. Um, we've looked at composites. This is our ARL emphasis, composites for military and defense. Those would include the UAVs, the personal protection vehicles. Um, one of the interesting projects we're doing right now is a clamp for oil and gas drill rigs. And so it's a, it's a, a large clamp that provides uh, neutral buoyancy for the drill rigs that would go in <laughs> and we've completely developed and, and are producing that in inside. One of the pieces that I personally like is we have some composite laminate structures that we've provided for the tornado uh, protection and so we've actually tested those where we've made glass uh, 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 fiber reinforced composite panels that would be replacements for um, uh, underneath your stairwell of your house or anything else. We've actually tested those in tornado type applications and they've survived pretty well. So, so we've been, um, had healthy activities and all of those. Here's a couple of the pieces of equipment that we would be using for this. So uh, this is just a sample of some of those things. We have plasticators, extruders, the compression uh, presses, and uh, some various sizes to all of those ranges. Um, twin screw compounding, single screw extruders, etc. on there. So enough with the composite side of things. Let me dial into some of the metals activities that we've been doing. Um, one of the things that, that I, I will talk about, metal casting is around you all, all over the place. I mean, you guys uh, being in, a, in uh, the mining side of things are aware of this. Um, this particular story, and I like to frame this in terms of stories, um, the USS New York, the bow of the USS New York was actually cast out of material that came from the Twin Towers when they fell and those were, they was, were cast at a foundry called the Meat. And so I'm going to show you a video of the, and they treated this as if it was uh, sacred, right? So they got the Twin Towers steel that was remelted and then put on the bow uh, ship of the USS New York, which was primarily tasked to go out and, and fight terrorism that was there. So this is showing you an example of, of steel that was poured from the um, uh, uh, Twin Towers that, that fell there. And so this is the kind of application that we've been um, dealing with. These would be my industrial customers as I'm trying to find out how to improve their properties and everything else. And there's a lot of things that you'll notice in this. I mean, it's, it's hot. It's um, smoky material, but this is the highest strength. This is the advances that are there. There's some things that come from our old industry, and there's some things that we adopt from, from the new industry that, that um, we try to understand as we go through this. All right, so I want to show you an example of steel being poured in our lab. This is actually our lab. Um, I showed you the sort of overview of the lab, the 9,000 square feet. This is actually showing you a high strength steel um, this is used in ARL um, development activities. And there's a couple things I want to point out to you on this. This is an induction furnace. It's 100 pounds um, of the material. We're direct pouring it from the, uh, the furnace into the mold. And then I'm, I'm going to let it play here, and then we'll go back. And, and I want to describe a couple other things for you. All right. So the induction furnace is there. It's melting. and if we go back to the beginning here. All right. What we do is we do a cover gas on this. And so you can see that we've got a, um, a cloud that's coming off the top of it. We're actually dripping liquid argon on top of this to provide a sealant and a cover for it so that we can maintain the quality of the metal. Uh, the steel in general, of the, these high strength steels, any kind of oxide, intermetallic inclusions in them is going to degrade the properties. So by covering it with the argon material, then we're able to seal it essentially from any exposure to the oxygen. And melting down very quickly and pouring it into the mold uh, provides us a nice uh, uh, clean material that we can actually go and, and then test to meet all the property targets that are there. So you can see it's very hot activity. This was actually run with just one operator. Our, uh, yes? Why not do a bottom pour? So this particular system, we poured directly into the mold um, onto a chill, but we actually have it set up where we could do it as a bottom fill as well. 
Um, we don't have enough time. This is such sensitive material that if it doesn't start clean, we don't have enough time for actually everything to flow it out of it. So, so well, I meant uh, the, out of the, the metal comes out of the bottom and still the top. This is a tip pour furnace. Um, we can also pour out of the bottom of this one, but this one is just not designed as a, as a bottom pour um, system. So your bottom pour, just like I showed in the previous image, is melted somewhere else and then transferred to this ladle and then extracted it out of the bottom. Um, this particular furnace is just a tip pour um, furnace in this case. And in, you know it doesn't make as much of a difference as long as it's not exposed to the oxygen. It's not dropping through the air, then, then you're in good shape on that. But it's a, it's a good question. We also take a lot of the data from this. So we'll pour into a chill wedge. Um, this particular geometry is for looking at material properties. And so you have thermal couples that are placed in it. And we watch the cooling curves. And we look at the microstructural development from the chill block up through the thicker sections of the casting. Okay, I'm going to show you some production we've also done in our lab of ductile iron. So ductile iron is interesting. We, we do the same thing. This is in our 500 pound furnace at this point. And um, we have it supported by a crane. We are doing a transfer in this case to, a, to an actual uh, ladle. And we have treatment alloy in the bottom of it that contains magnesium. And so we pour the iron on top of it. And then there's a reaction that you'll find is uh, quite bright and uh, produces a lot of uh, violence on there because the magnesium, of course, uh, reacts and with the reaction it becomes a vapor phase and bubbles up through it. That's how you retain it and can modify the graphite in the structure from being a gray graphite into uh, either a CGI or a ductile in this case. So what we do is we tip. We don't tip out all of the material but we tip out maybe a hundred pounds in a tap. Go ahead and do the treatment and then we can transfer it over and we can do a, a direct pour in our lab. Now you'll notice this is uh, you know, pretty current. We've done this in the last year or so. And so you could see everybody has the right safety equipment and we do a lot of training of our students for how to handle and pour these materials um, safely so that we, we don't have any problems. The, um, the material that we're pouring, we're actually doing as part of a project for the Department of Energy and Caterpillar looking at higher strength engine blocks. And so we're testing out different combinations of graphite morphology and alloying to try to uh, create material that would be suitable for higher peak cylinder pressures and more efficient engines uh, in this case. So you can see some of the uh, metal handling issues and, and chill wedges that we would be um, pouring as we go through this. And then I'm also going to show you a video of us pouring some magnesium. Turn off the sound in this case. And we do have a cover gas that goes over this as well. So John is removing the, and it, this is a resistance furnace. This isn't like the induction furnaces I, I was showing before. Um, but this is relatively close to that, that mold. We also bring down um, uh, the handler. We had some concerns from safety in terms of pouring magnesium. Uh, this is the second or third time. This video is of the second or third time we poured it. Um, and we actually found it to be pretty calm um, as long as you're, you're aware of what could be going on. So our, our cover gas is getting applied. They're going to hook uh, the material. And Move this along a little bit. Okay. So after you raise the uh, magnesium up from the resistance furnace and move it over, you can see we've got the cover gas being applied. Um, we had an industry rep, David Weiss from Eck Industries. He is one of the, the in the U.S. leading experts in terms of magnesium and uh, metal matrix composites. And uh, he observed our practice here and, and sort of qualified us for this. You'll notice that you do get some reactions even with the cover gas inside. You can tell you know, from the bright um, uh, areas that you do get some burning inside. But the cover gas does a pretty good job of keeping it from being a runaway uh, reaction. But we, in the first couple trials of this, we had a significant amount of sand to dump on top to try to put it out and everything else. For me, it's, it's fun to watch some of these materials because you can, you can tell uh, the heats and, and the timings that go on with this. 
one of the things that's of concern in magnesium, it's such a light alloy, we, we add um, uh, zirconium to, to help promote grain refinement in it, and that's heavier than the magnesium itself. And so its solubility is such that we keep on adding it to add grain refinement, it sinks to the bottom. So if you stir too vigorously, then you get, you get um, poor properties from that. So you have to be pretty cautious with, with the alloying and the treatment to, to make everything work. One of the big things that our students get out of metal handling is uh, uh, testing of the safety equipment. And so we do what we call splash testing, which is we take the aluminized fabric that's there, we use a small handler and uh, set it of a particular weight, it's normally about a pound. We pour directly on the safety fabric. So all the fabrics you see us use in the lab, we've also tested for safety. Um, and we're contracted from McWayne or from US Steel to test all the fabrics they bring in inside to make sure that they're suitable. So, so our students get a lot of metal handling activity because we do that on a, on a per month kind of basis. This is uh, more my area in terms of CFD modeling for metal casting. This is an example I, I like to show just of, of how we do this. So the impression we make in the sand molds that we pour into normally have a feature, it's just like an ice cube tray, and so you can see the, the shape that's being held. This would be what would be metal after you fill an empty cavity of a mold, and this is showing you that delivery. So I showed you what happens when we melt, we transfer to a ladle, and then we pour into this. What you'll notice is that when you do a CFD model, you both get the, the free falling stream that occurs in this area here, the backfill up the sprue, and then also the, the sort of splashing and everything else that would be uh, associated with the filling event. So this gives us a lot of information to diagnose um, pros and cons in terms of, of looking at simulations and um, finding defects that might occur. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, for instance, when, when we were doing this work, we were really interested in whether this rigging system would actually work for the final part, and um, it turned out it, it had some, some pretty big defects in it. After the part is filled, you look at the solidification, which is the cooling process. In this part of the simulation, what we've done is highlighted the entire part as white when it's fully liquid, and then as it cools, you're reducing the fraction liquid, and so you go from a white contour down to some of the red, uh, reddish contours, which would represent 50% liquid. And what I've done is made the material, which is more than 50% liquid, transparent so you can see through it. What this does in a solidification simulation is let you look at isolated liquid, okay? So as this thing solidifies from the outside to the in, um, the innermost parts, you get a shell that forms and you end up with isolated regions that might occur. If you've just focused in on this area, this cloud that you see here would represent a completely isolated region which has no liquid metal path up to a riser and because of that it's going to form a defect, a solidification defect that's there. And that's essentially how we use this tool to diagnose whether this was an adequate gating system for, for a, a, a part. This is the comparison then for that actual part that I just showed you and some of the isolations that were in there in our simulation prediction as well as some of the defects that you see. And we can use this essentially to diagnose our practice and, and make sure that we um, have everything in conformance. So the other opportunity that we have uh, in our lab is we do real-time x-ray. This is an example of a robotic pour within our lead line vault. So this is a video inside the lead vault um, where we have a real-time uh, or an x-ray beam that's going through a mold and it lets us look at, just like I showed you on the simulation, I showed you a transparency and showed you what was filled and what was not. We can also do that with our real-time x-ray unit. This is showing you the robot handler that, that is dumping the metal into the mold. And then if I go forward to this aspect, this is showing you real metal that's poured in a mold. So we're treating the mold as transparent. You're actually looking at, I think in this case it's aluminum that's poured, and you can see the flow come in, you can see it float up, you can see how much gas gets entrapped in, in the bubbles where they end up. And so we can think of this as a CFD system, you can see where it all is, and uh, compare that to your simulation results and see. So some of the projects that we've done, uh, uh, 
concurrently while I've been there over the last three years, high strength steel casting alloys. Uh, these are very high strength. Your normal high strength low alloy steels are in excess of 40 KSI. These are some 180 KSI yields, um, 240 ultimates uh, KSI um, strengths. So they're quite strong. Uh, your high strength cast irons, we've poured materials with over 800 MPA. Uh, ultimate strengths for a CGI material. We've also poured high strength cast aluminums. So I never thought when I went to UAB, being a modeling guy, that I would be working with such high strength materials. But, but that's really what we've spent a lot of time doing um, over, over the course of the last couple of years. My modeling work is focused on mostly casting related defects or um, uh, other kinds of, of uh, uh, materials that are there. So for the core of the technical aspect of this presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about a magnesium story. Um, this is really as, a, as it relates to our, our project with the ARL group. Um, I just showed you us pouring magnesium. You're probably wondering, okay, so you're pouring magnesium, so what, what's going on here? So there's a uh, FAA test that just came out by Timothy Marker in, in 2013 where they did some flammability tests of magnesium and the basic concept is this. If we could replace all of the seats in our, <coughs> our aircraft liners with magnesium rather than aluminum, you could save about 20% of the weight, which would represent a good savings of cost and fuel and other things. The worry is magnesium is flammable. So what alloys do I use to replace the seats where I'm not in risk or fear of it catching fire and, and posing a risk to the, to the um, uh, occupants that are inside? I mean, I flew here, so I wouldn't want to fly on something that I had a risk of catching on fire. So this um, FAA test that's shown here essentially used an oil-fired burner and burned several commercial grade magnesium alloys to see what the flammability risks were. So you can see some of the tests. Um, generally, they had to hit it with a flame until it melted, and then uh, you get some ignition event, and then they tested how long it burned before it self-extinguished or if it did not self-extinguish. So essentially, this was, this was the test. Now, this seems all fine and good, um, and it's a fairly dry report. I took it, uh, you know, and was reading it as I was falling asleep and everything. But then I got to this section of the report, where they built an entire fuselage um, that was representative of, of a Boeing 707, and they pre-tested the entire configuration of a, a set of seats, put everything together, and they go, the report goes into excruciating detail about how difficult it was to put these seats together and how they were having struggles putting it together. And then they lit the whole thing on fire. <laughs> so it was, it was a pretty entertaining report to read because they built this fuselage because what they wanted to do is demonstrate how risky is using a magnesium seat in terms of, of on an airplane. If you had a fire next to it, how hot does it need to get before, before anything bad happens? So my, this is my audience question. One of these is aluminum, one is magnesium. Which one, which one would you think is magnesium and which one is uh, aluminum? Any guesses? It doesn't make any difference, right? <laughs> I don't want to be in either one of those seats. So, so I think the point is, and I think this one is magnesium and this one is aluminum, but, but it, again, it doesn't really matter. You read through the report, essentially what happens if, if a flame happens and you've got burning in there, it's the seat cushions, it's the plastics, it's the other things that are going to be of high risk rather than the metal components that are in there, even if there's some flammability thing. So the point is the FAA approved the WE-43 because it passed the self-extinguished tests on these little coupon samples, but they also concluded that it performed, that the magnesium alloys performed no worse than the aluminum in the full-scale uh, tests that were in there. So we were essentially asked to say, okay, WE43 passed, the rest of the magnesium alloys did not pass, so they were not approved by the FAA because they didn't pass the small-scale tests, even though you know, they might have passed or at least been no worse than the aluminum in the large-scale tests. But can we develop a magnesium alloy with, with less rare earth than the WE43 and maintain the flammability targets but cut down the rare earth content that's in there? So we can pull up some phase diagrams. Um, the WE43, uh, based on, on some of the phase diagrams that are there, you get a eutectic in the mostly magnesium side that, that you may want to look at. Um, the, the, particles that you're going to get on the fully enriched side are some intermetallics that come out uh, with neodymium and, and some yttrium um, content. And we think it's the dissolved, the saturated uh, matrix structure 
that has the yttrium that, that helps with this, right? So essentially, we don't mind these intermetallics. If they go away, it's OK. We just want to make sure there's enough um, uh, oxide-rich, uh, uh, oxidation-rich uh, yttrium that's there that can combine and keep the flammability that's there. So we did some calculations with CalFAD tools. This is a JMAT Pro simulation with the, the base content of the WE43 where we were able to show that you know, we could probably flex about half the content and we'd still be okay. And so that was essentially the design that we came up with uh, for looking at dilution. So we did a dilution study using the original WE43, which had a total uh, content of about 5%, and then we diluted it down to about half its content based on the trials that I showed you earlier. We built our own chamber, so this isn't the one from the original test. This is one on site where we have it. Uh, we used just a propane torch, and we, we started moving it along. And the idea would, would be to go ahead and put the torch in and I'm showing you this in reverse order how we ran the experiment. When we started, we tested the W43 and everything self-extinguished and it had no problems. So we thought that was not a very interesting result. So we went back and tried some relatively pure magnesium just to see if we could get it to, to uh, fire up and go. So this is an example of a, a uh, test coupon that we created of, of pure magnesium. So it was a saw cut sample through a pure mag magnesium bar that we had. We went ahead and put the flame, we measured the flame temperature and the amount of magnesium that was there. And you can see that even after I withdraw the flame from the magnesium alloy, this is the same test that I know I did in high school and you might have done in high school as well. You light the magnesium on fire, you get a bright white and it just keeps on burning, right? It doesn't go out. So this is the, ex uh, the expectation that you would have for an alloy that, that you would not want. If we use a different type of alloy, this is an AZ-91, so this would be an example of a die cast uh, uh, alloy that might be used. You can see some speckling, um, some things uh, going on there. Once it really gets going, you'll see the result here as well. So these are, are two example alloys that we wanted to try that should not pass. And this would have been similar to the example that you would have seen from the FAA test where it lit and it continues to, to go, although I can show you it here with a video um, versus, uh, versus in stills from a, from a report. So, so we did this test as well. So that piece melted, fell into the bottom, but continued to burn even after the flame was removed. So what happens with this W43? W343 alloy with its rare earth content shows some sign of starting to uh, spark um, that's there, but, but it forms a pretty tenacious skin. In fact, this is a, a straight on view of it. It almost looks like a plastic baggie with liquid in it. It pools, it gathers in there, but it actually it ceases to burn even after we withdraw the flame. So you can see the results here as it continues to um, uh, reach an ignition temperature. It, it can, it, with, as the flame withdraws, it, it self-extinguishes. Yeah? So the seats aren't <clears throat> the, a huge percentage of the weight of the plane. And so you're saving a little bit of weight and you're saving a little bit of mileage. How much does this stuff cost versus the aluminum? And how many million miles you got to fly in the airline for it pays for itself? Yeah. That, all the rare earths in it. I mean, that's got to be some. <laughs> That's the question, right? And so the premise of the FEA study was essentially could you replace this to get the weight and the fuel savings. On a pure weight basis, magnesium isn't that much more expensive than, than the aluminum, but you're, you're buying the same volume but, but less weight of it. So, so it is more expensive on a per pound basis, but on a volume basis, it, it's, not, it's not too bad. Uh, in the terms rare earths you've alloyed into it? The rare earth containing one is much more expensive, right? So, so that one is a concern. And, and again, good motivation for trying to get some of the rare earths out to, to try to make it more comparable in terms of doing that. The FAA has approved magnesium alloys to be in the console. So if you're up front, you're the pilot, and you've got your instrumentation panel, that can be made out of magnesium. But nothing in the passenger side can be made about, out of magnesium until a study like this was done. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to make economic sense if you put the accounts on it. Yeah, I think um, some of that is still under debate. I, my impression from at least our objective of doing this is to maintain the flammability targets 
that we achieved with the higher rare earth containing and not see any degradation of performance of the mechanical properties. And then there's other applications that I think are of interest to ARL outside of seats. But you know, in a car, if I go from an iron engine block to an aluminum one, I can justify that. But this looks to me like you might be having to fly that plane for 160 years or something before it pays for itself. Well, with a weight reduction of 20%, I mean, it's not... But in the seats only. But in the seats only. you got to carry the fuel and you got to carry the fat guys like me on the plane. Uh, I, I think that um, if you just look at it at a per component basis, I think they can still justify, I mean, it's, it's not that hard for them to get it because they can die cast this alloy just like they can, you know, the, the, uh, the aluminum alloys that are there. So I think that that's still possible. But, but yeah, that, that remains to be seen in terms of the total economic benefit that's there. This is still more of a material question first. So that's good. good point. Any other questions on that? All right, so then I'm going to show you, this was the WE43, that was just the, the scrap that we received. If you do the same specimen then, and I, I don't, I'm not, this is the diluted, I wanted the picture from the same vantage point. So this is the diluted uh, alloy, so you're, you're almost half of the rare earth content from the original one. And, and essentially the behavior looks exactly the same. So we, we see no ignition event that continues to burn. Although you'll notice in this video, it does tend to, to last. The self-extinguishing characteristic does uh, take a little bit longer to, to go into it. Yeah? Is there a particular reason it's at 1470 as opposed to 1600 in um, We reached a different flame temperature. We recorded the flame temperature in every case, but um, it depended on how far it was and how much flame temperature we got in there. So we recorded it for these set of tests. But if you look through the FAA report, it wasn't sensitive to the flame temperature that was there. So it's not like this was a worse test than, than the other. But it's a, it's a good point. So in our flammability results, they we were consistent with what we found from the FAA. Uh, essentially, <coughs> Pure Mag and AZ-91 both failed in the self-extinguished test. But in the W43 alloy and all its dilution succeeded, um, our future work in this, and, and this is in different stages at this point. Um, we're characterizing the microstructure. We've run into some problems as we polish this thing for corrosion. Um, we're aware of that, and, and it's, it's not the easiest thing. And we've poured tensile bars that we're pour, uh, pulling in all of these. So, so I'll show you some of those results as we go through it as well. We do have some other rare earth content things that are not WE43, but other alloy strategies that we want to look. And, and of, of course, we aren't quite done with the distillation, um, uh, uh, the dilution study. We also have a project. We were talking about, I was talking with Jerry about this, where we, we built a still uh, for the magnesium as well to try to get the rare earth out and uh, uh, con um, uh, condense the pure mag on the other side and look at the um, enrichment uh, products that come out. Here's some preliminary characterization results. You know, it, these are not polished very well, and so I'm a little embarrassed to even show them, but, but I, d I didn't have other pictures to bring, and so I'm still going to show these. Um, and the one thing I can say, if you look at the light and dark spots, it appears that from our first pour, which is the original alloy content, down to the fifth pour, where we have half the rare earth content, you can see the number of potential sites in between grains tend to go down as you go uh, from the, the original alloy down. So this would be consistent with eliminating some of these intermetallics that are coming out in such, we, we think we've, we've still got an alloy that, that can be successful. Um, certainly the strength should go down as we go through that and that's why we've got to do the mechanical test to, to make sure we hit the mechanical targets. So what are those targets? Um, I'm showing you them here. Then if you look at the fracture surfaces, we did this fracture test based on our industry advice. If you are not successful at grain refining this by adding the, the zirconium, then you will find some larger planes and you'll actually see the difference in grain structure between them. So in this case, we would conclude that we were successful in terms of our grain refinement because we don't see any difference in the, the fracture um, as we, we broke these. But this was critical to, to ensuring that we had a good alloy for testing. And then, Jerry, you were asking about the, uh, some of the, um, uh, the uh, distillation uh, equipment. This is a couple pictures of how we've actually set this up. So it's, it's a, um, uh, basically, we've got a lower chamber with a heater on it uh, with, a, with a small piece inside. And we're condensing on the upper end of it with, a, with another tube to cool on this side. So, so we've done some uh, vacuum tests. Uh, we've confirmed that. And we've actually run 
some preliminary study with it, but we haven't actually tried to distill uh, magnesium yet with it. So, so that's part of the ongoing work that we have there. All right, so some of the manufacturing, uh, the recap, I've told you about manufacturing, I've, I've told you about the uh, impact cap capabilities, told you my magnesium story. Um, I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge the uh, Army Research Lab and the task number that's on here. Our task is entitled Reduction and Recovery of Rare Earths and Magnesium Alloys. And then let you guys ask, ask me any questions that you have. Yes? So since you said those uh, half alloys were passing the self-extinguishing test, uh, have they been approved by the FAA yet, or are you working for that? We, we have not taken that in our charge of this. Um, right now we're preparing these materials for ARL, and then once they have decided that they're um, something they want to try, we're going to take an application and actually try it in whatever form they want to do it. So we haven't decided to go to the FEA at this point with this alloy, but it's a good question. Yes? Okay, so I was very interested in that the photographs you had of, or, and the, also the modeling you had of mm -hmm. things cooling in these unusual shaped um, structures or casting um, because presumably there's either thermal expansion or thermal contraction as um, a metal goes from being melted, mostly it's contraction to being solid, unlike water, which goes the other direction. When, when that's happening, I mean, do you get like bubbles places? And, and you know, presumably in the application, you actually don't want bubbles or voids. It might be voids instead of being bubbles, but how do you manage that sort of thing? Or is that something you study also? So, so in my work within Caterpillar, um, what we would do in a case like this is actually try to design the section thickness so that it, we call it a directional solidification, where it would freeze first in one area and freeze last in the riser. So you never see an isolation that would occur in this. Because any time you would notice this pinches off, one of these clouds kind of becomes on its own, it's, it's going to have a big yeah. void in the middle of it. Yeah, and, and we actually designate that in two different ways. One is we call that macro voids, macro porosity. And then if it's just not very directional, then you can get micro voids that are in there as well. That micro porosity is a fatigue problem and everything else. And so we look at both of those two uh, features of it. So yes, and, and it gets worse if you, so we have to normally look at both this picture on the solidification, but also the CFD side because the splashing and the mixing that you see also entrains some air. And so that, that's another quality concern that you have. Even if it doesn't generate a bubble, the oxide film that you're going to get, you know, as, as uh, John Campbell likes to point out, the bifilms that you would have are, are crack initiations as well. So we have, to, we have to look at both of those two things. So good, good question. Yeah. So when we talked earlier today, <coughs> we were down in my lab and we were looking at the 3D printer. And you said that 3D printers are your new best friend. Could you expand on that a little bit? And second, can, um, can you mention the three new national lab or um, manufacturing centers? Mm -hmm. Are you working with any? And if you are, as a university entity, are you finding that to be beneficial? OK, so on the first question on 3D printing, um, our technology that we have in the lab uh, started out as a lost foam. That was before my time. But lost foam is a process in which you take styrofoam, uh, like a coffee cup or anything else. You bury it in a loose pack sand. You have it on a vibration table, pack it in, and then you pour on top of it. In fact, that's why this particular video um, has so much of a flame that comes out of it when it finally tips in because they're actually pouring on lost foam, and that has a back flame that's on there. So I say 3D printing is my new best friend because on the one hand, I can 3D print the patterns to make impressions. I can also pour directly on 3D printed parts and try to get the, uh, the part in, in that sense as well. And, and in either of those two cases, it gives me another option for rapid prototyping 
um, which, which helps companies come in and explore all the design concepts they'd like to, uh, to look at. So, so yes, we like 3D printing quite a bit in, in our lab. Both DFM models as well as we've got X1 down the street, which actually 3D prints cores and patterns as well, where you have a, a, a sand media and you spray a Furan binder system on it and build up the patterns that are there. So, so we, we like it quite a bit in, in terms of that. Um, in terms of your question on the innovation institutes, most of them are not up and running except for the America Makes. Uh, the last contact I've had is, is that most of the contracts are being signed at this point, but nobody's gotten any money out of that, the other two yet, the DMDII and the uh, Lightweight Metals Institute. They're forming, they've got projects on their, their topics, and we're not counting our hit chickens before they're hatched, but we, we think we've got a project um, starting in May from the DMDII, and we also have close partnerships with the uh, uh, Advanced Lightweight Metals Institute as well, and, um, but that one's still got a little bit of time before we know what happens there, so. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff um, so if you go back to your x-rays, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, so you're, you do a lot of CFD, and so you know, we talked earlier about when I took fluids, you know, I was told by my certain fluids prof that that you can't model it without experiment there and hand. That was years ago. But I think Charlie confirmed that that's still true. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you said you validate a model with, with maybe some of this x-ray. How, how do you go about, once you get an x-ray, you have a model, what kind of parameters do you tweak? How do you go about modifying your model to refine it with results based on something like the x-ray? So, so we have sort of the traditional CFD tools that are uh, that are with us. So, in the thermal side, you have heat transfer coefficients that you're going to adjust. In the turbulence flow kind of simulations, we use mostly K, K epsilon kind of models for the the either Reynolds scale of the turbulence and everything else. I think where a lot of the advancements are is in looking at surface tension effects in the developments of the early stages of porosity growth and other things. That's really what is detrimental to the manufacturing process. That's where the crack initiates. That's where all that stuff happens. So those kind of early solidification events are not very well understood, and there's not a lot of tools to, to access that. And so what's been done to date is you pour something and then just cut it up. Serial sectioning has been, been the primary tool for it. So, so what we try to do is couple this with our models to try to see what is the governing phenomenon that's there. So pressure drop would be a good criteria for this. So if you have a young Laplace equation where you're saying, I have this critical pressure drop before I initiate a bubble, is that true? Is, you know, what are the surface tension requirements before you reach that? And, and then you also seem like you incorporate the thermal losses after the pour, because that's important too, right? So we actually try to incorporate them during pouring, um, but, but not in every case. It, it, we can either decouple it or couple it, in, depending on the application that, that we have there, so, Thanks. yeah. So that's a real-time experiment, that's not a simulation. That is not a simulation, that is so a real-time. Can you tell us how you managed to see, I mean, inside of this chamber, inside of this box? Um, <laughs> it's, that, it's, is, is that something you just go out and buy, or is it a system? I think our system, they bought the system, this was before my time, it was about 2000 when they acquired the real-time x-ray unit, and they um, uh, basically have a lead-lined vault that's about half of this room in terms of size and and they built it it's completely surrounded with lead and then they have a, a source we either have a 160 uh, kV micro for, micro source beam source or we have a 320 kV source and essentially the sand is transparent but the metal being of a higher density is is not and so that's that's essentially the way we we go about doing this so that source is inside of your lead line chamber exactly so if you and look at the and if you look at the box, essentially what happens is you have a source on one side and a detector on the other. And so it's a 2D, 2D plane, but the advantage is instead of having like a CT scan where I rotate the object and look at it from three dimensions, I am recording that real-time x-ray you know, in time. And so I can look at 2D surfaces. And so if I did have a surface which intersected that, where one intercepted the beam of the other, I wouldn't see the background, but I could see the net. And so we try to keep a 2D object as we look at the, the filling. So in this case, it's just a, it's just a plate. You know, so you basically have a, a gating system that comes down, squirts in this side, and you can see the, the circulation that's there, which also motivates the kind of bottom fill. So it's like an ant farm? Exactly. So exactly like, like an ant farm. Really 
but we, we don't have to require that it has no material in front or in back. It can still have sand on either side, but it well, does. It's x-ray transparent. What, what's the imaging radius of the max that you, like, it's really fast event that you capture? Um, depending on the acquisition system. In this case, we were acquiring to, I think it was VHS. So I think it was an analog acquisition system. So we also have a, and, and essentially that's, that's um, depending on your acquisition system, that's what you're limited to. We still are requiring basically when we had it installed, it was still to an analog system, but we're trying to uh, get a digital system to give us a little bit more acquisition speed. So, but yes, we're, we're limited to about the 60 Hertz at this point, so. Good question. More questions? So let's thank Charles.